You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Otto Penzler back on the show with me. He has... Uh, you may remember that he was on the show with us last year talking about the big book of espionage, this massive honking... Um, collection of stories uh, all about spies and spycraft and what an amazing collection that was so when I saw that he had a new collection coming out this year the big book of Victorian mysteries I just knew we had to get Otto back on the show to talk about it um, this this collection of stories is absolutely fabulous Otto and uh, thank you for bringing it to the world and thank you for joining me again thank you so much for having me again Hank It's uh, it was fun last time and I know we're going to have a good time today. Absolutely, we sure are. Um, so, Otto, when we when we talked last year, it was uh, it was last fall, and um, you know we were talking about what a crazy year 2020 had been. And um, refresh uh, our, our listeners on on the um, the unique place that you have in in book selling there in New York. Um, you have uh, this fabulous bookstore. Um, and it, 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 it specializes in, in certain types of fiction. Um, but it, it's been kind of a, a tough time for booksellers, hasn't it? Well, it was, you know, uh, in New York city, we were forced to shut down, uh, from March to June, March 13th to June 8th. We weren't even allowed in the store, uh, but June 8th, we were allowed to open again and, uh, I brought everybody back. My staff came back, I came back, and uh, it was a struggle for a while. Uh, you know, the Mysterious Bookshops has a specialty. It sells only mystery, crime, suspense, uh, and I include espionage fiction in that literature. Um, so as a niche store, we, we have the disadvantage of we don't really sell a, a wide variety of books. So we miss out on a lot of big bestsellers. Uh, we don't sell political book. We, you know, we don't sell anything except in our genre, which is a disadvantage in one way, but because we have such a broad range of paperbacks, used paperbacks, new hardcovers, signed hardcovers, used hardcovers, rare books, uh, that we do have an international clientele. We have customers all over the world uh, because we can satisfy, we can find books and provide books that they're looking for. Our great strength has been signed books. I mean, rare books, certainly, but also signed books. And that's where it's been the toughest for us because we can't compete with Amazon or Barnes and Noble who frequently discount their books. We can't compete uh, on price. Uh, rent in New York being astronomical and sure. my, my staff being very overpaid. I hope they can hear me. <laughs> uh, so our overhead is, is brutal. So we can't discount books the way Amazon does, uh, but we can provide autographed books at no extra charge. So that has been our lifeblood. Well, since the pandemic, authors aren't touring. So we right. really seldom it's harder for us to get signed books. We've started to, to really have a pretty good system of, uh, and the authors have been so great. They really are fabulous. They let us send cartons of books to them, which they then unpack and sign and repack and call us. We send and have it pick, have the books picked up. Uh, and so we're able again to supply a lot of signed books, not quite as many as in the past, but we're we're back, and now uh, over the last two months or so, we're doing live events in the store again. Uh, we we customarily have done roughly a hundred signings uh, a year, uh, in-person events, 
And then we were doing some virtual events, uh, but it's not the same as being in the store. And we're starting to do those again. The first live event we did was with Joyce Carol Oates, which was just great. And we've done several since, and we have plans to do more. Well, with with doing 100 signings a year, that that comes out to roughly two signings per week. Um, I would imagine. Were you, a math, are, were you a math major? <laughs> <you're right. laughs> I, I would imagine some weeks, maybe more than two, some weeks, maybe right. less. But, you know, as an average, um, that that is something that I feel like that we are losing uh, in in our culture now, Otto, is, you know, with with Amazon and, and Barnes and Noble, um, I can literally um, think about a book or, or hear about a book, open my phone and have the book, you know, either the Kindle edition immediately on my phone and then have it automatically synced to my Kindle, or I can have, you know, a book drop shipped to my house in, in a day or two. And, and while that is convenient, um, what we're missing there is this, this community that builds up around bookshops and, 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 you know, places like yours, uh, that, that have events where people can congregate, come together. Not only are you supporting that particular author, but you're also supporting this, um, this community, uh, feeling and, and how do you think that we're going to regain that, uh, in, in a time where where digital books and digital book selling is is encroaching on um, this thing that has been such a vital part of of the 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 bookish community. Well, uh, I can say, uh, I mean, there are several issues that you just raised there. One is the actual events, and uh, and we're, we're as I said, we're already beginning to do it. Uh, to bring them back. Uh, there are other bookstores in the country that are having live events again. Uh, it, it's a little slow in New York City. A lot of people are still uncomfortable taking public transportation. Uh, we don't ha- we don't drive in New York if we can possibly uh, avoid it. Uh, so it's, we're not like most other bookstores, which are in malls or in places where uh, it's convenient to park. There's no place that's convenient to park in New York, just none. That's just a, a flat out general statement. Uh, but we're coming back and more and more people have been vaccinated. And so we're we're starting we're seeing it and we're, we've arranged several events coming up this year. But it's not only about the uh, the actual events. It's also about um, the store being open. People can get there and walk in and talk to our staff. Uh, so they'll see other customers in the store. Sometimes they interact quite a bit. Um, and we've heard this a lot lately, even before, and this is really this is really interesting. Even before the pandemic, we were getting customers coming back who who had been had been customers and then kind of stopped being customers because they found it so convenient to uh, to order from Amazon. Uh, and get their their fix instantly on their Kindle uh, or have books shipped to them right away. And I, and I try to point out to them, first of all, we ship books too, and we get them out the same day. We're no different from, from Amazon in that regard. Sure. Uh, so when people say, well, I really, you know, I just want to get the book right away. So uh, I said, okay, we'll get it out the same day. No problem. We This is what we do. Um, but also, in, and I think this may surprise you a little bit, during the the height of the pandemic, ebooks ebook sales. And I, you know, I have an e-publishing company called MysteriousPress.com with over two thousand mystery titles on it, uh, and they're available on Kindle and they're available on Nook and and any other device that that uh, that readers have. Uh, we saw those sales go up by about fifty percent, but at the same time. And this is really almost hard to believe. Physical books increased in sales. Everybody said, oh, well, bookstores, they're doomed because nobody's buying books. It's it's not true. People bought more books than ever because they were locked out. They they couldn't go to work. They couldn't do so many of the things. They couldn't travel. They couldn't go to Broadway shows. They couldn't go to movie theaters. So they, they stayed home and read. So book sales, both electronic and physical went up during the pandemic and have stayed up month over month. But this year, 
compared to say 2019 or 18 or 17, the sales have gone up, which is which speaks really, really well for uh, for book publishing, for book selling, and for for readers. It's just it's really mostly all good news. I'm happy to say. Absolutely. Um, Otto, I I remember we chatted a little bit last year about the role of um, suspense, thriller, mysteries, and and why those stories resonate so deeply with us. And and I I think in in talking with you and then talking with with so many different thriller uh, and and mystery writers, is that. Um, you know, through these stories, we can we can kind of wrestle with some of the big questions about life um, from the safety of our reading chair. And, and sometimes we, we can wrestle with those things w- with them being couched uh, in in a story that that on the surface seems nothing like what we're dealing with or is, is not necessarily reflective of the real world yet. Um, yet we we can kind of work through some of those those issues through story and and you know that there's kind of a magic to it in 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 a way that uh, that these things happen and um you know our our minds process these stories in in really unique and and impactful ways um but looking at your new book victorian mysteries and we're talking about mysteries uh, I think the the collection that that you've put together is forty nine stories. Uh, is that right? That sounds about right. Yeah. And and uh, they they take place uh, or, or were written between eighteen thirty eight and nineteen hundred, uh, give or take. When when looking through these stories and and revisiting some of these classics to include in this collection, um, were there themes that that jumped out at you? And and I guess really what I'm what I'm asking is uh, the stories that that we're telling and selling now, um, are are they reflective of the things that that writers and readers were going through, you know, almost 200 years ago? And in, in some cases, um, d- do you see the same human condition uh, events popping up? Well, you know, a good writer, uh, a good fiction. I'm talking about fiction writers now. Uh, and I'll say specifically uh, mystery crime suspense writers, but it's true of all fiction writers. They they provide a true picture of the time in which they're writing, assuming they're writing contemporary novels, obviously, or, or short stories. And it's more true, what they write is more true than the nonfiction of that same time, because nonfiction uh, let's say it's it's a political book writing about the politics of the day uh, or or the war or uh, so, social uh, uh, norms and uh, they're generally told from a point of view and so they they tend to be somewhat slanted to whatever that point of view may be whereas a fiction writer is telling his story he he is focused on the plot on his characters, but inevitably, and this is about only, this only applies to good writers, inevitably, he is putting those characters against a background of that time. And so you see what life is like. I mean, Charles Dickens is famous for having been maybe more influential than any politician in getting some of the dire circumstances of the Victorian era fixed um, orphanages where where children were brutalized and so on, um, and the poverty that 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 reigned in in so much of London, and his portrayal of that uh, as background to his stories and his characters were tremendously influential in getting those getting laws changed to improve the uh, the, the plight of of the poor um, and the and the marginalized. The um, there's an American writer. Uh, when we think of Victorian, we think of England. You know, it's up to right. 1902 because she died in in uh, 1902. So the stories go up to 1902. Uh, we think of England, but uh, the, the whole world lived through that same era. So there are also stories uh, that have been translated 
uh, uh, Tolstoy wrote some wonderful crime stories. So did Chekhov, and they're in the book, and so are some Americans. Well, one of the Americans in this book, a man named Melville Davison Post, sadly largely forgotten today, uh, wrote about a, a, a dishonest lawyer. Uh, there's a shock. Uh, <laughs> uh, named Randolph Mason, and um, he had he took the position that he wasn't worried about you getting arrested, what he uh, or about getting you uh, off for committing a crime. He was concerned um, to have his characters do things that were not against the law. If it wasn't specifically prohibited in the law book, it was legal, was his position. And in one of the stories, he actually uh, advises his client to kill somebody, to get off. Uh, and that actually, his analysis of those laws got some of those laws changed too. And so, <laughs> yeah, so fiction writers really have a, uh, a, a tremendous ability to, to inaugurate change uh, even if it's not necessarily their point or the purpose of their story. And you see that in many of these Victorian stories where there's a background. I mean, some of them are uh, just pure fantasy. And I don't mean fantasy in the world in the way of, say, of Stephen King or J.R. Sure, Tolkien. sure. Uh, I mean, just like made up world that has nothing to do with reality. But many of the stories do, in fact, have a, have a background of uh of real life in that era. Dabble is a proud sponsor of Author Stories. Dabble is an easy-to-use cloud-based writing tool that gives writers a way to organize, plot, and create amazing stories wherever they are. Write in our desktop app, on your Mac or Windows computer, tablet, or mobile device. Dabble syncs your latest version with the cloud on all your devices. Write anywhere and anytime inspiration strikes. We got you. Dabble is my preferred writing tool, and I think it will be yours as well. Visit DabbleWriter.com for your free trial. You have an amazing story idea. You execute the writing and editing flawlessly, and now the only thing missing are readers. We can help you go from author to author superhero with Story Origin. Story Origin is a one-stop shop for marketing tools with a community of amazing authors working together to find reviewers, build mailing lists, increase sales, and collect feedback from beta readers. Everything an author needs, all in one place from providing review copies or beta copies, reader magnets to ensure you stay connected with readers, easily distribute audio promo codes, universal retail links to send readers directly to the proper point of purchase, or provide direct download links for members of your mailing list. Story Origin has all the tools you need in one easy to use site. Use the promo code ASP21 at checkout when subscribing to the yearly plan and you will get 10% off your first year. This code will expire December 31st, so hurry over and subscribe now. StoryOriginApp.com I'm, I'm glad you mentioned fantasy because um, in f fantasy in the traditional sense or the, the literary sense of of fantastical worlds with with, you know, sometimes magic and and, you know, the, the things uh, that that kind of define the boundaries of that genre um, it, in talking with fantasy writers, uh, a lot of times you'll you'll talk about how the appetites of readers have changed. Um, through the decades and in a story like Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, we may go a hundred pages before anything of of any um, I don't want to say substance. That's not the right where any action happens. There's a lot of world building, a lot of setting, a lot of um, getting the the feeling of the world before, you know, any any plot driven thing really happens. Um, and now, as a if a fantasy writer is breaking in today, um, you know you've got you've got about five pages to get someone's attention before um, they move on to something else. And and the the structure of story can't be the same as as Tolkien pulled off. Um, 
because it's just readers are are not um that they're expecting something different um have in in vis- revisiting these stories and um and a, a lot of these writers and stories we're familiar with others like you said um are are uh, writers that have been mostly lost uh you know to the sands of time um but in reading these stories do you have you noticed a difference in the way that we handle mysteries uh today as you know uh in in the the 19th century well that's uh hank that's a really that's a really good question and uh, i would say it in a way uh there is no difference really none the uh in the short form in the short story form you don't have a lot of time to start creating a different world or a, or uh devote too much space to uh, to background and to uh, non-essential material. Um, in novels, it's, it, there's maybe a little bit of, of a difference there because they're a little, they're much more leisurely the, uh, than we than we're used to in contemporary fiction. But in the short stories, the writer gets down to it. You know, there's a crime, there's a criminal, there's somebody who's who's going to be trying to catch him or stop him, whatever it is. And so it's a, an ongoing uh, methodology where you did it in 1850, you're doing it in 1950, and you do it in 2020. You, you have to get on with the story. That's the, that's the good news about short stories is that you get on with it. John Dixon Carr, the great uh, writer of Impossible Crimes and Lock Room Mysteries, uh, once said, although he wrote 49 novels, uh, he once said the true form of the detective story is the short story because really the rest is filler. So he's got his plot uh, and you can show it in a, in a short story and not have a lot of superfluous uh, other material. Um, now, there's a difference between a short story. A lot of people don't like short stories. They want to be more immersed in the character and the background of the story and enjoy all of that. And it's more popular in, or more common in Victorian fiction novels to have that leisurely pace where you really get to know the grounds, the house, the grounds, the dogs, uh, the, the serving staff, you get to know all of those people. Uh, and there are people who really like that as, as I do. I'm a big fan of Victorian fiction. Uh, I think my, probably my favorite writer of all time is Wilkie Collins, uh, and Dickens is close is close behind, and of course I'm an inveterate fan of Sherlock Holmes, and so when you read a Sherlock Holmes story, you think about Sherlock Holmes, you think about the eccentric character, and you think about his slightly slightly dimmer uh, partner and friend John Watson, uh, who's serving the function that uh, as for readers, he he. If, if we want to ask a question of Holmes, it's Watson who's asking that question for right. us. But so, in the short stories, particularly, Conan Doyle isn't trying to set a background to tell you what it's like in the Victorian era. But inevitably, they'll 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 leave their flat, their rooms at 221B Baker Street, and get a hansom cab. And so now you know that there's a hansom cab. And they'll talk about maybe the sound of the horse's hooves and going through London past the gas lamps. So even though it's subtle, you're getting a picture of that era and of that time. And he calls in the Baker Street Irregulars, his little group of ragamuffins who are running around. And he gets them to do some hunting for him or following people. And he rewards them with a shilling. Uh, and that's and they're not the part of the regular de- police department so he calls them his irregulars and uh and you really get to see how how excited these kids are these young boys uh to get a shilling which is not a whole lot of money but they're thrilled because they don't have any money so it's all part of the background but it's not being pushed down your throat it's it's just there and you absorb it without really paying attention. You don't say, oh, I'm so, I'm learning so much about what it's like in 1895 London, but you are picking that up. 
uh, even though it's not necessarily the author's intent or your intent as the reader, but it but it happens through uh, the subtlety uh, by osmosis. You're picking up all of that. Speaking of uh, the short story versus the novel, there there used to be um, these great markets where you could be primarily a writer of short fiction. You could sell those works and you could make a decent living as a short story writer. And then occasionally we would see these writers that would uh, either publish a collection of their short fiction or publish a novel that they had written. Um, but we primarily thought of them as short fiction writers, and Ray Bradbury was a great example of of a working writer who was constantly writing, uh, selling short fiction all the time, uh, the occasional novel, the occasional collection. Um, but he was he was absolutely a short fiction writer. Um, a lot a lot in publishing has changed over the last couple of decades, and. More and more of those markets are drying up where where you can sell short fiction. Um, thank God we have collections like the Big Book of Victorian Mysteries is you know is a, a collection of older stories, but there are still anthologies being printed now of of new fiction, and you know there's a market there. Uh, but what do you think about um, you know the way that people break into the market now? It, it used to be that. Um, you know, you would write short fiction until you could do the other. Um, but that's, that's sort of changing now, isn't it? Oh, it, it, it's changed a long time ago, Hank. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, Conan Doyle made much more money uh, selling his Sherlock Holmes stories to the Strand magazine than he did on his novels. Uh, in the turn of the century, uh, there are writers like O. Henry, for example, who, who never wrote a novel. And yet we all know who he is. He's very famous and made quite a good living at it. Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, some people claim that uh, that one of his uh, his works is a novel, but it's a novella. Uh, but his entire career was either poetry or short stories or right. criticism. Uh, then you know when as the there were fiction magazines all over the place that paid fairly well because that's how that's what people were reading, and. Uh, in those days in the Victorian era, full length novels tended to be rather big as, as I said, you know, they were much more leisurely. So it was very common for books to be published in two volumes or three volumes. A single novel would run two or three book, two, two or three volumes. And they were so expensive that the vast majority of readers uh, couldn't afford it. But they could afford magazines and read stories, and uh, and bought the books in serial form. Dickens, for example, uh, and and Collins and many others, uh, but but famously Dickens, uh, almost all of his books appeared in uh, weekly parts, uh, where you would buy a couple of chapters and pay a couple of pennies for it, and then keep reading. And most of them appeared in. 19 parts and then eventually the book would get published but but because they were so inexpensive as serials people would buy that but as for short stories uh there were so many magazines and then of course the pulp era came around in america particularly and writers were being paid a penny a word or two cents a word but the magazines were 10 cents or 15 cents uh, before that, there were dime novels and nickel novels uh, that that readers could afford. And the more uh, the more people became educated and more people became literate, um, there were more and more material being published for that uh, as literacy increases. They wanted more to read. And so publishers created more and more, went from nickel and dime novels to pulp novels. But in the uh, in the in, in America, in the early part of the 20th century, and even into the middle part, um, magazines like the American Magazine or Collier's or Scribner's, uh, Saturday Evening Post, very famously, paid vast sums. F. Scott Fitzgerald, when he was writing for the Saturday Evening Post, was paid ten thousand dollars for a single short story, and this is the wow. 1930s. That's like that's like getting a hundred thousand dollars today, sure. and they could afford to do it because the circulation was in the millions, and there are no magazines 
publishing fiction that have that kind of quantity anymore, that number of, uh, of stories, uh, that number of subscribers. Uh, the, the major subscription magazines today are things like the AARP magazine <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, House and Gardens has, has millions of circulation. But magazines that used to publish a lot of fiction, like Red Book, uh, which became a women's magazine uh, in the middle of the, of the 20th century, they published The Thin Man. They published the first edition of The Thin Man. They published so much wow. fiction that they could actually put in a full-length novel. Those days are gone. That's incredible. Well, Otto, um, when you start thinking about a collection like the Big Book of Victorian Mysteries, what sort of rules did you set for yourself? What sort of boundaries um, a- as you started you know, digging through this this vast amount of stories that are out there um, and, and start kind of – did, did you have a, a, a kind of a grand vision for this? And, and uh, you know, was there a, a narrative thread that you were trying to put together? What, what were some of the ground rules that you set for yourself? Well, Hank, uh, you know, I, this is the, I think it's the 12th big book that I've done for Random House. Uh, every year, October, uh, there's a new book and uh, it's got a subject. It was Sherlock Holmes mysteries, uh, stories one year. It was Christmas Mysteries another year. It was uh, uh, Female Detectives another year. And so uh, when I deliver that book, I tended to have lunch with my editor and we would talk about the next book. And I would come up with an idea and he would say, sounds great, go and do it. Uh, So then it would take me roughly a year to do the book because I read three, four, five hundred stories to find the best. But uh, the, 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 the notion, the, the idea, the concept is created by the title. So last year was the big book of espionage. So obviously, not hard to figure out, they were espionage stories. So my boundary was what? It was, had to be an espionage story and it had to be good. And I tried not to, in almost all of my books, I tried not to use more than one story by an author, uh, by a single author. Uh, I I wasn't totally committed to doing that, but I tried. I didn't want to publish like 11 Sherlock Holmes stories in the big book of Victorian uh, uh, mystery stories because they're readily available elsewhere. But I've been, it's important to know that for 50 years, a little more than 50 years of my life, I have been devoted to mystery fiction, and I, I'm a, I've been a voracious reader since I was four years old, and so I've read a lot of mysteries, and so I have a pretty good idea of what I want to be and whatever the subject is. I have a sense of, oh, I know I know the people who wrote great female characters for the female uh, detective book. I know uh, all of the parodies and pastiches that have been written about Sherlock Holmes, not all, there have been 25,000, but I know a huge number of them and I know the good writers. And then I've I've read many of them. So I would go back and find those stories that I remembered and and reread them because what you loved when you were 27 may not be what you still love when you're 67. And so I reread the stories, and uh, and then I, that's how I picked the best stories. And because uh, they're big books, I didn't have a space limitation. My editor was great about it. Like, if the stories are good and you've got 70 stories, as I did for espionage fiction, um, then let's you do all 70. The espionage book is 1,100 pages. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> you know, Victorian is like a mini book compared to that. It's only about 600 and something pages. Um, you know, it's the equivalent of three or four normal full length books, whereas right. the espionage was the equivalent of six or seven full length books. Uh, so, so I didn't have that limitation, but all I had to do was find the best stories for that title, for that concept and the books you know after that there there was the book 
the big book of Victorian mysteries when you're hearing this show is going to be available everywhere. Uh, we're going to have links to it in the show notes where you can grab it, um, you know, in Kindle edition or paperback. But please go visit your local bookstore and uh, let's keep this culture of bookstores thriving uh and it's important and and I, I hope other people realize that and do as well whether you are a uh, a fan of of mysteries and thrillers and uh and want to revisit uh some of these stories that maybe you read as you were younger or you want to kind of visit the the foundations of of this genre and and what we now appreciate uh in in the modern uh, mystery genre the, these will uh, absolutely entertain you and this will not be time uh, wasted to dig into the big book of Victorian mystery 640 pages I believe it is um, enough to carry you through the the dark uh, cold days of winter for sure um, Otto if if people are just discovering you and all the great stuff that you're involved with where can they find you and all of your work online the easiest place is www.mysteriousbookshop.com. Uh, there's a, a, a little button there that says about Otto Penzler. I'm um, there. It lists lots and lots of books. You can sign up for our weekly newsletter. It's free. There's no obligation. Uh, you'll see a lot of books. You see a lot of books that I've edited or, or written. Uh, and of course, every major writer of crime thriller espionage detective stories in the world uh they're they're all there love it we'll make sure to link that up so that people can easily find you and all of the work that you're involved with the big book of victorian mysteries this is a must-have and you know what it would be a fantastic gift to give to that uh book lover and that mystery lover in your life for this holiday season That's auto a commercial hank thank you <laughs> <laughs> well, Otto, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you. Um, thank you for doing all that you do, and uh, we wish you much continued success. Thank you so much, Hank. You're a real gentleman. I appreciate it. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. The year was 1834. The month was December. I was 14. Irving's tale was by then well known. The characters of Brom Bones and the beauteous Katrina were widely understood in town to refer to my parents. Rumors persisted. I heard the name of Headless Horseman whispered. My father dismissed all these tales, calling them malicious. Yet more than once I saw him and my mother scanning Agatha's face across the supper table, finding only a secret smile and a look of defiance. I found the rumors fascinating. I followed Agatha like a pup, waiting for her to cast some magic spell. And one day she did. The household servants had set a fire in the hearth for her comfort, and she sat close to it, counting out small gold coins upon a lap board. I hid in the shadows, hoping she might drop a coin and I could retrieve it for myself. One of her servants, a West Indian girl, carried a snowy log into the room and set it on the fire, it began to hiss and pop. The snow melted, and the fire sputtered out. Agatha cursed as I had never heard her do before. She stood, spilling all the gold, and slapped the idiot girl across the face. The girl ran, and my grandmother muttered to herself, searching for match and tong to no avail. When she was not looking, I crept forward and took for myself one of the gold pieces. Then something remarkable occurred. My grandmother sighed, knelt before the fireplace, reached for the logs, and her right hand caught a fire. Flame blossomed and coiled about her wrist. I gasped and cried out, Shh! Don't be afraid, my Dylan. Your hand! She raised her palm. Flame sat cupped in it, casting the shadow of her fingers upon the ceiling and walls. Lock the door she said. I obeyed. She pointed to the floor, and I sat, waiting breathlessly. This is the Van Brunt gift. It will be your gift as well, soon, 
and your children's forever afterwards. Why does it not burn you? I asked. Why should it? Do I deserve to be burned? No. Then I am safe from the fire. Do you deserve to be burned, my Dylan? I shook my head. Show me. I reached for the flame and took it. I pulled back at once, crying out with pain, wagging my fingertips. The fire caught my sleeve. I could not rid myself of it, as if I clutched burning tar. The pain intensified. The blisters broke, and a rivulet of lymph ran down my arm. Your conscience knows, Dylan. You deserved to be burned. Say it. I deserved to be burned, said I. Again! I deserved to be burned. She turned her palm. The gold piece. I nodded and brought the stolen coin from my pocket. She took it and raised it to the light. You cannot wield the flame with guilt in your heart, son. Try, and it will devour you. Do you understand? I nodded. A Van Brunt should not be so weak. I'm sorry I took the gold, Grandmother. I'm sorry I was bad. Don't be ashamed of me. She frowned and laid the gold coin on her lap board. She shook her head sadly. I'm not ashamed that you took the gold. I'm ashamed that you felt the guilt.